Jesus likes to change our perspective. When we think of great ones, we might think of Donald Trump or President Obama. Or we might think of great kings and rulers, the influential people, Hollywood starlets, singers, songwriters, the people who are famous, the movers and shakers we call them. And Jesus presents to us a child. And then he tells us that unless we become like this child, we shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Talk about counterintuitive. Because everything that we're used to teaching ourselves says, you better grow up. You better become a self-made person. But children are not self-made. To confound the issue even more, Jesus then talks about that which seems absolutely ludicrous to the human mind. A business owner would never risk leaving 99 sheep to go after one lost one. But God does. Jesus shows us in this message a divine extravagance that perhaps gets lost on us because too many times we are thinking according to the world and not according to God. The way of God can see, like we saw in Ezekiel, difficulties, wailing and woe, lamentation, wailing and woe, as something that's actually sweet when we see it being gobbled up or consumed. That is, when it is taken on and then God redeems it. The lamentation and woe that Israel was going through in the time of Ezekiel, that exile, was not going to be the end of the story. Because that lamentation, exile, wailing and woe was going to be changed into rejoicing. And there's even a psalm that talks about that. When the Lord brought back the captives of Zion, we were like men dreaming, it says. And that's God. God has these promises for us that continue to remind us that he is good. And we've heard that in the psalm. We want to take a look a little bit about the extravagance of God. Remember the woman who comes with the alabaster jar, breaks it, and pours this precious perfumed nard worth 300 days' wages, okay, if you can imagine. It's basically like a year's salary, all over Jesus' feet. What a waste, they might say. What a waste. And some of, the, some of the disciples, and Judas included, complained. What a waste. Could not this have been saved? Could that not this have been sold and the money given to the poor? Not that Judas was actually that concerned about the poor. But still, it smacked against his reasoning. It smacked against his understanding. And Judas, of course, we know, wouldn't let God transform his way of thinking... Because for kids, extravagance is normal, right? Every kid is either a king or a queen or a prince or a princess, right? They play superhero all the time, whether Wonder Woman or Spider-Man or Batman. They're never like Joe the custodian, (laughs) right? They're not. Extravagance and... Just the impossible is the way of thinking for kids. The impossible is possible for them. If we want to continue to look at the divine extravagance, God's wasting, if you would, God's graciousness, we only need to look at Mass. We only need to look at this mystery that we celebrate day in and day out. For the lowest, most meanest, 
And greatest of sinners, God sends his son, Jesus, to die for on the cross. As if they had been the only one. That's divine extravagance. Today we celebrate St. Maximilian Kolbe. And those of you who aren't familiar with his life, he was a, he was a conventional Franciscan friar. Um, he was ordained in 1918, shortly after, of course, the apparitions of, of Fatima. Devotion to the Immaculate Virgin Mary was heavy on his heart, and he founded the Militia of the Immaculata. Okay? Something that he saw as being this group that could be knights for Mary. Again, it's this extravagance, this kid-like thinking. You know, knights of the Immaculata to be used, not just, not just to do the will of Mary, but to be the will of Mary. He didn't want to just do Mary's will. He wanted himself and those who followed in his footsteps to basically incarnate what Mary would will. Of course, Mary's will because of the fact that she's so united to Christ that it would be Christ's will. That was St. Maximilian's understanding of that. Actually, they named him Maximilian because he was so zealous and wanted to strive so much for holiness that he wanted the, the maximum, so they called him Maximilian. Maximilian. Eventually, his preaching and his teaching and his, zealous, his zeal for souls gets him arrested by the Nazis and he gets thrown into Auschwitz. And there we see his life continuing to show the divine extravagance. Because there was a man who was about to be sentenced to death. As a punishment because some prisoners escaped. So they, the Nazis decided they were going to pick people to die in place of the people who escaped. And the one man began to say, oh my family, but my family... And here this priest steps in and says, I'll take his place. But think about our understanding. Think about what it means as Catholics. We think of priests as such a precious commodity these days, right? Because there's so few of them. And in our human reasoning, we might be afraid. We might say, oh no, Father Maximilian, don't do that. Because you can continue, and you can continue to save souls afterwards. So this, this layman, and his, you know, who has a family, shouldn't count as much. And yet, in the divine economy, Maximilian steps in. And says, I will extravagantly pour myself out. Partly because it was already God's will that he be a martyr. When he was young, the Blessed Virgin Mary presented him two crowns, one of purity and one of martyrdom. She says, which one do you want? And he said, I want both of them. And she says, okay, I'll give you both of them. So he already knew what kind of life he was going to be living. He already knew that he was going to be going to his death eventually. And so he stepped in at the right moment, at the right time. But he still had a choice. He still had a choice. There were many possible choices there. Many things he could have chosen. But when the moment came, he set aside the possibilities... To say, I'm going to say yes to what was preferred by me and by God. What we determined together. So that asks us this question today. Are we willing to set aside our little agendas, our way of thinking? To ask God to show us, to strip away not just our possible choices, not just the plausible choices... But what God chooses, no matter how wasteful it might seem to us, no matter what it might seem like, because God is generous. And for God, we don't 
think in terms of lack. We don't reason from lack. When the disciples were in the boat with Jesus, they had one loaf among them. Among them. And Jesus said to them, be careful. Do not be affected by the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. And they're like, oh, it's because we don't have any bread. And Jesus says, what are you talking about? Okay, it's not about the bread, but let's talk about the bread. And he says, listen, when we had five loaves and two fish, and there were 5,000 people, and you distributed the, bas- the, the, the loaves, how many baskets did you collect afterwards? And they told him, that was 12, right? And then the other time, how many baskets did you collect? Seven. And he shows them, he says, do you still not understand? We, as human beings, we're used to looking at what isn't there and operating out of fear. With God, instead, we are called to look at what is here. Jesus. And to then operate out of his divine extravagance. Because he's the one who told us, ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, the door shall be opened. We don't have to be afraid. So today we ask St. Maximilian Kolbe specifically to pray for us that we might be as generous as he was, but also that we might be willing to adopt the thinking and the mindset of Jesus. An extravagant and generous giver. Amen.